Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. Today we're doing a panel about the philosopher transgression, the scientist of filth, surrealist artist, writer of erotica, seeker of the sacred, uh, Georges Bataille. Um, I think it's fair to say that he's some kind of mystic, maybe a very unique mystic. And, and people love to link him up with Gnosticism. He actually, uh, he wrote a brief essay on the matter, excuse the pun. Uh, and uh, even though he sort of has mixed feelings, and of course scholars will argue because there's pre-dog uh, if he really understood Gnosticism well, I think he did. So joining us for this awesome panel, we have uh, all-time returning champion. Uh, we are going to uh, send this trophy to Nick for being on oh. the show <laughs> nice. at, least, at least a dozen times. Yeah. Wow, yeah. So uh, look for that in the mail, Nick. Uh, oh, I, I just, you know, it says right on there, uh, number one Talknosis champion. But theologian, writer, your best friend, Nick Lachetti. Hi, Nick. Hi. Hey, everybody. And joining us, actually, another returning champion, uh, Emily Russo, uh, artist, writer, scholar, professor. Uh, that you, do you have any other titles, Emily? Um, okay. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll mix them up for you. Uh, and if you come on 11 more times, you'll get a trophy as well. Um, <laughs> very excited to talk uh, to you both uh, about Bataille, uh, somebody who, who I do find very interesting and I've read a little bit about, know a little bit about, but at the same time, don't know much. You know, that's why we have more than one guest so that I can uh, uh, just release my ignorance into the world and let these very intelligent people talk. But before we get there, uh, I have to jump into the abyss of internet begging. Uh, we can't do this show without your support. Uh, you can help us out by going to patreon.com slash Gnostic, and you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can actually put a cap on that, just give us a dollar. Uh, you can also do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. If you can't help us out financially, you can uh, tell people about the show. You can rate, like, review, uh, all that good stuff. Actually, do that stuff as well. Look, I don't like doing this. We got to do it. I do this every show. Uh, but I would like to thank the patrons that we have. I'm always trying to think of something we can give you. Uh, and we do have some super donors. Uh, we've had some very generous one-time donations. We have some people who have uh, really given us a lot on Patreon. So I really want to thank you. I, I think we will go back to displaying your names in the credits like we promised to do. And yeah, we don't want to put, you know, I'm not criticizing anybody who does this, of course, but we don't want to put extra content behind a paywall because we want to spread the light of Gnosis. Maybe today it's the it's the darkness of Gnosis, <laughs> but whatever it is, we want to spread it. Well, maybe with Batai, it's a fertilizer of gnosis that I am spreading. Uh, okay, uh, that, Emily, you, you're actually teaching an upcoming course about Bataille at uh, gcast.ie. I got to put the plug in there so I can become a GCASI billionaire. Can you uh, maybe give us like kind of a quick overview of, of who Bataille of who Bataille was, right? Like, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of a biography and uh, a little bit of a slot, just, you know, the five minute elevator speech. Sure. Um, you know, George Bataille, I think, is a very hard to classify thinker, which is one of the reasons I like him, but he was um, a philosopher, poet, writer of erotic things, such as novels, um, sometimes under pseudonyms, um, a founder of a secret society, um, writing, he was writing um, in the 20th century, uh, and he was influenced by people like Nietzsche and also certain mystical teachings. Um, he, you know, the class I'm teaching and my interest in Bataille really centers around um, his his mystical thinking and also his sort of like uh, the form of his writing, which I think is like really inseparable from how he thinks. So, you know, it's like, are we reading philosophy or are we, are we reading poetry or are we reading fiction? It's, um, he sort of blurs the lines a little bit. So um, I think, well, I don't know, he's like, I guess, sort of thought about as a precursor to post-structuralism um, and an interesting thinker about matter, uh, which I guess we'll talk about today. But um, I don't know. I don't know. Is that like a, a sort of OK start? That's an amazing start. Uh, Nick, what do you like about Bataille? You can also tell us what you hate about Bataille. And uh, maybe you're the best person since uh, uh, you have some direct experience with Catholicism. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about Bataille's Catholic background, if you see any of that as being an influence in his work? Yeah, um, so, yeah. I think I think with the Catholic background, what's interesting is that, I, I guess, uh, you know, he, he wasn't raised Catholic is my understanding, but was, you know, converted 
some time in his youth and was actually like very pious for a few years, like a short period of time. And I think I think uh, his biographer said, you know, he was he was pious in 1922 and then debauched in 1924. Is that, is, I think that was the timeline. So for me, the interesting thing about Catholicism, I mean, I have the background in kind of Catholic theology and, and Catholic mysticism and that sort of stuff is that Bataille never seemed to like get out from Catholicism to some extent. Like he always seemed to be writing against it, but in this kind of transgressive way that still has this really tight relationship with, with Christian mysticism and with uh, kind of Catholic ideas about sacrifice. And, you know, there's an interesting article that has a lot of this way more than me um, by, I believe, pulling it up by Michael Weingrad about kind of Bataille and, you know, the decadent Catholic movement in France in the 19th century. I think there's a really close relationship there, too. Um, so I think that, that that's some of it. Um, to me, it's it's sort of like Bataille as a philosopher of transgression. You can't really transgress or blaspheme unless you have like the real force or power of the thing that you're transgressing, which Bataille seemed to understand really well. So, you know, to be blasphemous, you kind of have to have some belief. So I think that that to me is one of the fascinating things about him and Christianity really. Yeah. And, and again, I think people would argue, you know, I'm going to stop putting this uh, this precursor about scholarship whenever I talk about Gnosticism. <laughs> I, I think the idea of Gnosticism as uh, counter-Christianity, as, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a dialectical Christianity that is both Christian but contradicts itself in a much more obvious way, uh, being a parody of Christianity, uh, it's, it's still an important idea, right? That this is something that, that a lot of people spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about in the past. So there's, you know, with Bataille, I almost see like an inversion by times, a parody, uh, and I, I see that as, as a Gnostic uh, uh, impulse. Uh, Emily, can you uh, talk to us a, a bit about uh, his sort of fascinating ideas about excess and sacrifice? Yeah, um, Bataille sort of, um, he thinks that the main sort of problem of being alive uh, has to do with not with sort of um, accumulation and how we how we sort of hold things but but rather how they're expended and how we um, use that which we have how we get rid of it um, he calls this sort of um, excessiveness that can't that's sort of hard to um, identify or label um, the accursed share um, and you know, there are many ways to be rid of this. Uh, he talks about like eroticism, poetry, um, but but really like this idea of sacrificing the, uh, in order to um, get rid of something, so sort of destroy it and make it sacred at the same time is like a central thing in his, in his thought process. So he has like a whole almost, um, you know, like a political philosophy sort of or an economy of excess using the sun as uh, the model. So so the sun like sort of gives endlessly and um, it's, pro you know, it gives more than we can possibly use. So uh, it's sort of this cosmic, uh, he, he thinks very cosmically and, and everywhere in Bataille there are these like sort of um, Poles. And so in terms of this idea of like sacrifice and excess, um, he really relies on like the idea of, a, of preservation versus um, expenditure. So like there is the form giving philosophical sun that um, lights our lives and sort of helps us make sense of things, like maybe something like the platonic sun. And then there is what he calls the rotten sun, which is the sun that destroys forms and uh, makes us go blind or mad. Um, it's the sun that melted Icarus's wings. So there's this idea of like a summit, uh, and at the summit there is also a decline. Uh, and so there's this movement, like sort of being alive in Bataille's writing has to do with like moving between these poles. Um, but we're part of this like big weird cosmic thing, always kind of sacrificing and preserving on and on. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm trying not to do a Melvin Bragg impression. You, both of you can jump in at either time or respond to each other. It's it's a panel. It's just yeah, yeah. rip. But, uh, but Nick, are you comfortable <laughs> talking about about base matter or based matter? Uh, maybe. <laughs> so I think 
Well, so I think one of the first things I think you and I ever talked about with Bataille is just this essay based materialism and Gnosticism. So, yeah. and maybe because the, you know, it's on, we're on talk Gnosis, it's a good idea to talk about it. But I think like the interesting thing about that is, is Bataille seems to be interested in Gnosticism in a way that's kind of opposite of what most people think of Gnosticism. So his interest is specifically in, you know, in this idea of, of, of a base matter that can't really be kind of reconciled or subsumed into like a totalizing, you know, system, like a closed system in some way, um, which he sees as in Gnosticism or in black, he talks about like black magic. And I think what he really is referring to more is it's closer to kind of, again, to go back to like the decadence, like J.K. Hussman's writing about, you know, French turn of the century occultism kind of has more to do with that than maybe ancient Gnosticism. But this idea that matter has this kind of virulent property that can't be subsumed um, and that and it's creative and um, you know, it's it's like the, it, the the basis level of matter. So I think that that, that that's a really fascinating aspect of his kind of early thought. And um, you know, the, the reason I say it seems opposite of Gnosticism is because you know the common ideas about Gnosticism being you know matter. And I, you know, I, I say this with all the disclaimers because then Jonathan can explain why it's not <laughs> that easy. But but matter being like bad, you know, like escaping and kind of a I think at one point in that essay, or it was either that essay or the big toe where Bataille says like, we don't want to have a tide that will like take us up and out of matter um, in this kind of platonic way. But, you know, so, and I think that that tends to be more what's associated with ancient Gnosticism, but he's really into this kind of the virulence of kind of the baseness. Um, so yeah, that, that to me, it reminds me of like, you know, it, it, it like gets stuck in your teeth or something. <laughs> like it, you, it can't, you can't get it out. Um, so I don't know if that's an explanation at all, <laughs> but yeah. Well, no, that's perfect. And it, it, of course, it's perfect for a show called Talk Gnosis, as you said. You, you know, I, I do, I, I think you're right where he's really reacting to, I mean, you know, he's a French man writing that in the, the 20s and 30s. You know, the, the French Gnostic revivals, the 1890s are still running around uh, and, and what's known as Gnosticism at the, at the time. But, you know, I just, there's some stuff I do see about his reading, particularly where there's, in some of the texts, there's this, you know, uh, Gnosticism isn't Manichaeanism, right? There isn't there isn't pre-existing uh, the split between good and evil that that will continue forever. But there are sometimes some mysteries where the demiurge doesn't create what becomes matter, but organizes it. And there's basically the texts don't really explain where where this came from. You know, sometimes it comes from basically Sophia's abortion. Sometimes it comes from her tears. Or I should say her miscarriage. Uh, and, but other times it's just mysteriously there. And, you know, in that essay, he seems kind of critical of Gnosticism at the same time and, and critical of, of the sort of platonic escape. And what he likes is this, you really have to reckon with, with matter. And, and Nick, uh, the, you know, maybe this, maybe this is a comparison that's completely off, but the way that he talks about, about base matter is, or the encounter of base matter is, is almost like the encounter with the alien god. Like, do you mm -hmm. see that at all? Like, there, there's a, at the same time, there's an alien, even though there's nothing in some ways but base matter, at the same time, it's completely alien to mm -hmm. our consciousness. Does that? Yeah, and, I mean, I, yeah, well, I yeah. think what it reminds me of is kind of, you know, it was interesting because both William Blake, I think, is, comes to mind a lot when I read that because the idea of matter and kind of evil as this kind of creative force. And then but then also, and we mentioned it before the show, but Austin Osmond Spare and then Kenneth Grant as well in terms of like occultists. Um, to me, it, it starts to resemble, you know, yeah, with Kenneth Grant, it would, it, there's a lot about kind of, Grant loves H.P. Lovecraft. So there's this whole thing about encountering otherness. And to me, it's like this, this base matter is, you know, the, that deep level of, of the base is going to kind of, you know, destroy this idea of you as a separated consciousness apart from the continuity of 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 all things um and that that starts to relate a little bit to you know when kenneth grant talks about in his weird kabbalistic way but he'll, he'll talk about you know the night side of the tree of life um the cleefoth like kind of the, the lowest level of of you know this discarded element from the tree of life that that kenneth grant is really obsessed with so yeah i think there's some connection there yeah, uh, Emily, do you have uh, the thoughts or explanations or things that you like uh, about his <laughs> ideas when it comes to base matter? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting um, essay of his. And I think what he sort of seems to find, I mean, I like what you said, Nick, about like, um, like getting caught between your teeth, like almost, almost it's like, it's like a residue. It's not even like what we would think of as base materialism isn't what we would think of as like traditional materialism or idealism. Um, 
And what he seems to find in Gnosticism is like a conception of matter that is not just um, the absence of spirit or something. It's not just negatively defined, but it's like an active principle that's disruptive in some way. Um, and I think that's similar to um, like what he finds in the Marquis de Sade, maybe like this idea of um, something that can't be assimilated. Um, and I really think that there's a lot in this text, based materialism and Gnosticism, that almost like help might help us or help a reader of Bataille like fit, like think about how to read Bataille because he's such a specific kind of reading experience. Um, like it seems he, he talks a lot about obviously like what is not appro appropriable, which is um, base matter, and it's almost as if he's making something that attempts to be disposable or not appropriable but at the same time he's recognizing that writing a book or when you when you write something you're doing you're you're sort of preserving it up it's like sort of so this impossible sort of paradoxical move is always happening um but yeah it's just this like disruptive element and i do wonder like yeah he wrote it before like the nag hammadi was found but i, I can't help thinking like he'd be really into some of the super interesting poetic Gnostic scriptures. Yeah, I, I concur. Uh, Emily, so we, we've both mentioned that he's he, he's a mystic, at, at least of some sort. Like, what? How, how do you see him as a mystic? Or what is his mystical uh, system? Or uh, you also teach and study and incorporate like the medieval mystics. Where do you see points of comparison with them? Yeah, Vitae is a funny kind of mystic. Um, he, yeah, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre kind of like famously condemned him as a, as a new mystic. And this was like a very bad thing, you know, he was sort of like dissing him. Um, and he was concerned about his um, his trilogy of writings that, that he wrote during World War II, Guilty on Nietzsche and Inner Experience, which sort of outline-ish, I mean, uh, in a kind of fractured and fragmentary way, like a, a certain kind of mysticism or a mystical philosophy. I mean, I think most importantly, he thinks about mysticism as not something like opposite or separate from philosophy, but as um, one of its antecedents and also maybe like the extreme edge of it. Um, same with poetry. So um, there's something about... Um, mysticism for Bataille, I think, that has to do with not, it has to be, it's sort of a mysticism without mysticism or religion without religion, because it can't be like sort of subservient, like base matter, it can't be like subservient to some kind of higher authority or God. So he finds in like the Christian mystics, like Angela Foligno and, and St. John of the Cross and others, um, a, a moments where they seem to be not, um, you know, appealing to some higher authority. And he finds this in Nietzsche too, in different ways. He kind of makes Nietzsche like this fallen sort of on the ground mystic, uh, mad mad person. Um, and so it has to be a negation of the self. It can't be some kind of search for wholeness or subordinate to utility or some kind of salvation. Um, so it, it really has to be like a, an, a sacrifice of form uh, for a moment. Of laceration if i'm not sounding too like out there i don't know yeah this yeah. is a show to get out there <laughs> <laughs> i think to, to go back to the catholicism thing the interesting I, one of the things that always interested me is that one of his first his first published writing i think was a very pious uh, essay about a cathedral and uh, and i think you know i think dennis hollier talks about that like in against architecture where you know there's this idea it reminds me of the if the cathedral is kind of the physical form of like Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica, and then Bataille's writing, you know, those three books as the atheological Summa, that there's this element of Bataille kind of cutting off the head, like there's an ontological head that he's like cutting off with this writing, it's kind of writing against, you know, there's this absence now at the summit as opposed to this kind of very ordered hierarchical uh, ontology that, you know, he's, that, that his form of mysticism is kind of undermining, which which really does relate to the idea of like base matter again or inner experience. I mean, that it can't be subsumed into this total system or something. There's always that thing that kind of in his writing that, that kind of catches. So um, yeah, I don't know. And, and that kind of relates to his secret society too, so. 
Yeah, I love that. I think, I mean, I love Dennis Hollier's book on Bataille and right, like, uh, I think it's Against Architecture, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I, and when I taught about Bataille last year, or whatever, what is time? I don't know, a few months ago, a year ago. Um, I was, I talked about this exact thing. I think it's a really helpful idea, like the cathedral and the labyrinth, mm -hmm. um, because he sort of chops the head off the cathedral or smashes the windows or whatever. And so then you find yourself in like the guts, like in the acephalic figure, the head is below the guts. And there's something um, about mediation a lack of mediation like a direct encounter uh where you the light is very very bright i think about like the light streaming through the, a cathedral it's like quite mediated it's almost like a film it's very um there's a sense of order and everything is holding everything up in this in this interesting firm way and then like in the guts it's um you know who knows what's gonna happen it's not a safe space yeah. <laughs> So I, I didn't really make an explicit or or tie in transgression. Like, in what ways, uh, Emily did did he transgress? Did he try to transgress? And, and does this tie into his his mysticism? Yeah, um, yes. He so, um, and I'd be curious to hear what Nick said about this too, because it's like a compl <laughs> complicated. But um, he, I mean, I think maybe a place to start with this question would be he really makes a firm distinction between the sacred and the profane worlds. Um, and so transgression would be a kind of moving between these worlds. Um, and it at once sort of um, surpasses the boundary, whatever boundary is set up. Um, but it also like affirms that boundary. So I think it's almost like we're with the same situation with the labyrinth and the cathedral, they kind of affirm each other. It's not like, you can totally be rid of the cathedral or Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica. It's like Bataille's Summa is like a broken computer or something, but we need the computer too. Um, sorry, I'm just, I just, sorry, I just always think of Thomas Aquinas's Summa as like a computer. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's <laughs> like a very well functioning, like input, output. But um, yeah, so there's something about taboo, you know, kind of guards the threshold and then you cross, you sort of commit the transgression and you're on the other side and you're somehow um, getting into the world of, you're profaning the sacred in some way. But I think, um, I actually think Foucault talks about this in an interesting way and he talks about mysticism too in his essay, um, A Preface to Transgression, where he kind of like, it's sort of like his homage to Bataille, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's all. I, I I don't know. I'll probably have more to say about that later. But that's all for now. Yeah. And Nick, do you have thoughts yeah. on uh, Bataille transgression? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because I think that Bataille transgression is like one of the reasons he there's. I mean, it feels like it happens every so often where there's like a turn against transgression in some way, <laughs> like especially in terms of politics. And so I think you know, and I think one of those things that you know, in order to transgress, you have to have the force of the thing you're transgressing in some way like you have to have the taboo to break in order to for it to be meaningful and that that when i was speaking about like blasphemy it had, you have to i mean this is a, a concept in, in occultists we're talking about you know if you're you know a satanist or something but you don't believe in in god then your satanism isn't very transgressive really <laughs> it, it kind of loses the force whereas like you know you have the decadence of the 19th century they're like saying this but then they're also catholics and it goes through this dialectic of like shame and grace and it goes then back and forth so i think that bataille has a relationship to that that's that's really interesting um and i think you know i don't know i mean the, the interesting thing for me is this idea and i don't know if you mentioned it but the idea of like seeking continuity this like lost continuity which relates to bataille's idea of the sacred so um you know through and i don't think I'm, i feel like i'm gonna not be able to explain this that quickly but through like this transgression or these limit experiences that kind of break the bounds of this kind of like discrete self, you can get back to this level of continuity that's been lost. Um, and to me, that's that's part of Bataille's mysticism that's really interesting and, and starts to, you know, it's not about like a, like we were saying, like a platonic ascent or um, it's not about, you know, kind of elevating yourself and escaping the world, like, you know, through the cathedral or something, but is actually seeking this kind of lost continuity um, and that 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 happens only through this kind of sacrifice um, 
so yeah, the, the, the intimate relationship between transgression and, and returning to that kind of lost continuity. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think he even defines religion at one point as a search for a lost continuity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's only because we're humans and we have these like codes of conduct that transgression can exist. And that's also how eroticism can exist because there's like some kind of transgression or some some sort of movement um, of expenditure uh, or waste or whatever where you're not upholding those um, you're not trying to preserve your life or yourself uh, for even if it's a moment so yeah I think he says like communication communication for him is not like a, a movement from point A to point B with like a medium in between it can only take place between beings that are somehow like shattered or discontinuous yeah right yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about transgression. Uh, Emma Lee, why, we talked about how he's sort of a hard figure to peg, and he is, sort of sits between a number of uh, different schools of thought. He hung around with and interacted with uh, fascinating people, fascinating minds, but he was associated, is associated with the surrealist, but, but I understand there was a break. Why, why did they give him a, the, the boot? <laughs> um, yeah, he's sort of a dissident surrealist. Um, Andre Breton, I believe, called him a philosopher of excrement and found him to be not like not a good surrealist, I guess. But he thought of himself as like an enemy of surrealism from within. Um, so I think a lot of the sort of goings on at Asafal, his secret society and the College of Sociology, which was sort of like the public face of that society, had to do with, I think, you know, a lot of those dudes were sort of dissident, like sort of um, dark surrealists or something. Um, but I think he, you know, he thought that um, the surrealists, um, among other things, were like bringing the dream world and, and things that were uh, sort of sacred or heterogeneous up into the world of utility, bringing them to the light and using them um, for like the boot to uphold some kind of bougie order. Uh, yeah, but it's but um, but I do think I think he I mean he he certainly like sh is a surrealist in in a, in a way and sort of recognizes himself as such. But I'm not actually sure. I mean, do you know Nick? Like what the specific like drama was? I'm I'm forgetting. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I I haven't read his writings on surrealism. That that one book. That's one of the things I haven't. But I think like I do think that there was some element of um, you know of this, this relationship to mysticism that d did have something to do with it, right? That he was being seen as creating a kind of like neo-mysticism that wasn't, um, <laughs> you know, so I think that that had to do with it, but I, yeah, I can't speak to the break directly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Nick, uh, you wrote a, a very popular article, one of your most popular articles, uh, <laughs> comparing this transgressor with another famous transgressor who, at least on the surface, you know, there's there's some some symbols that keep popping up, like the anus, uh, the sun, uh, the darkness, and it is, of course, his contemporary, uh, Al Alistair Crowley. So you, you wrote a piece sort of comparing their their ideas about mysticism, the, the, the end point of mysticism, uh, mystical extinguishment, uh, annihilation. Can you talk a bit about that piece and sort of compare and contrast the, their their two uh, paths or two thoughts or two ideas? And, and I understand since you've written that piece, which we, we will still link up, that, that you've had some changes in thought or some new ideas. So if you could tell us a, a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the, the piece I wrote with Alistair Crowley and Bataille was just, um, and it was especially indebted to reading this. It was kind of my notes on like a, an essay on Bataille by, uh, I think, Jonathan David York. So a lot of it has to do with his kind of interpretation of Bataille. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think with Crowley's mysticism and versus Bataille, I think the reason it was kind of a popular article is because Thelemites like to argue about like Crowley and the AA and, and like his mystical path and stuff. I think so. I, I think if I rewrote it, I would still say a lot of the same things, but I think really at the heart of it is this disagreement between Crowley and Bataille and also Crowley and other people like Austin Osmond Spare and Kenneth Grant, like we've been talking about, um, where for Crowley, like the world is actually pretty intelligible, I think. Um, and that's really 
you know, his his path of mysticism, though, he's seen as this figure that's really transgressive and, um, you know, like dangerous and, and all that kind of stuff. He didn't, he had a very kind of turn of the century British, you know, the word that I, I can understand things, like I can incorporate everything, all experiences into my being, like this can create like a complete and closed system in some way, um, which doesn't mean there wasn't any elements of like, like kind of like limit experience or anything in Crowley, because there definitely were, but Crowley tended to like write in a way that then, then kind of made all those things smoother, <laughs> like later on, which, you know, you could read against, you can't read him against himself in that way. But, and Bataille, you know, one of the things I would see that I really like about Bataille and that is really important to me about Bataille is just this idea that, you know, the universe is kind of open-ended and it's, uh, you know, I think Bataille, I, I think he said somewhere it's like an open wound, like you can't like close everything up into this perfect, you know, I, I mean, one of the things he wrote a lot about is Kojev's interpretation of Hegel. So this idea of like a perfect closed system, whereas for Crowley, you know, there's not a lot of room for like horror and, um, you know, unknowability in Crowley in a lot of ways, like his mystical path, uh, which kind of takes you up through the tree of life in this kind of ordered system. Um, you know, it, it involves, and I think in that essay, what I quote is Crowley in one of his later writings, talking about how, you know, everything you are um, has to basically encompass the universe. So it's first this kind of expansion of consciousness. You've taken everything into yourself and you're now one. And then you can give that up in, in the cup of Babylon is Crowley's metaphor. Because if you, keep, if you retain anything, if you don't have this perfect, if you haven't kind of expanded your consciousness to be perfectly enveloping the universe, then there's going to be something remaining when you try to give this all up. Um, and then that's what creates in Crowley's system this idea of a, a brother of the left-hand path, um, which is, I think, why that essay was popular is because I was saying Crowley would think Bataille is, is in the left-hand path, which I think is probably true because Crowley thought like everybody he didn't like was in that. And so, But for Bataille, again, like we're saying, you know, there's this, this base matter or um, there's something that can't be subsumed in that way. Um, and, and for Bataille, kind of, coming close to the, to that is what kind of ultimately will, you know, allow you, you to kind of destroy the, or undo the self and, and to regain this kind of lost continuity or intimacy. So it's not that they have different goals. It's just that there's a, Bataille, you know, has this more open-ended idea of reality and it, it kind of allows for kind of horror more in a way that I don't think Crowley does. And so not, not all this is my idea. Actually, like a, some of this has been a conversation about Crowley and the difference between him, him and Kenneth Grant as well that I've had recently with Thelemites, like Frater and Telekea is one of them, um, that, you know, Crowley, like Kenneth Grant as well has this interest in the open-endedness of reality and in horror that Crowley would never really be into. Um, so, yeah. So I think that that's probably how I would say it now, a little bit less, like, sexy. It's not, not so much about the Black Brotherhood or anything, but but I think that those differences are true. Yeah. Uh, Emily, we, we didn't really talk about Eros and, uh, and Eros and the erotic uh, uh, playing a, a, a huge role in uh, Bataille's work. Can you, can, you, can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, I mean, there are all these sort of important ideas or words or whatever in Bataille that I think can almost not be used interchangeably, but they're like they form like this constellation and I think that um poetry um for some reason I mean I'm I'm like mostly a poet so I sort of come to him as a poet he's like sort of, yeah so he, so for me there's like something uh in the way he thinks about poetry that's like a gateway to his erotic his erotic thinking and writing um he he says that poetry and um sacrifice or um expenditure are almost like synonyms um because poetry is a kind of sacrifice in which you know the victims are words and and like there is this like relinquishment where words kind of get uh changed in order to become more than they are and they're not obviously subject to utility so there's something about like a, a a mutilation he calls he calls he has this like really interesting uh text called like i think it's the severed ear of vincent van gogh and something else but he talks about um you know van gogh's cut off ear <laughs> being this like sort of uh kind of matter that's disruptive we could say base matter that is like the self thrown literally to the side of itself um in a kind of ecstasy that um is maybe you know related to to this idea of of poetry also being like this 
this like mutilation of words or text. And you can see this also obviously in Bataille's text, like Dennis Holley says in Bataille, the transgression is a transgression of form. So I think that's very important also when we're thinking about like this idea of eros or eroticism in, in his work and thinking, because it's always some kind of uh, change or alteration of form where matter is not, it's not that it's like formless and like end of story. It's that it's like this weird operation where matter is not subordinate to form. Uh, in the case, he, he cites like examples like a spider or spit or, or something like that. But obviously they have forms, but they're just sort of very hard to track and they're disruptive. So this idea of like um, something always changing and uh, something being sort of both grotesque and alluring is important for his, his eroticism. It's not just sort of, um, it's not what we would necessarily think of as like Plato's eros, where there's this like Cupid's arrow situation. Uh, it's more, I think, a little bit um, almost Dasadian maybe uh, in the sense of I mean, we can think of like the story of the eye, which is like maybe, I guess people seem to like know him through that novel, yeah. um, which is just totally bonkers and really interesting. <laughs> um, because obviously like there's just, I mean, there's just so many transgressions going on. There's like the murder of a priest among other things. Um, but the eye is really, I think, I mean, the eye goes many places, like literally and figuratively, <laughs> but um, that, that like sort of literal sort of removal of the eye or the enucleated eye that um, can be used as almost like this erotic instrument or something that is also like very drunken and maddening uh, is like sort of has to do, I think, with both poetry and, er and eroticism for him. Um, and also, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Godard's movie Weekend, but there's like this big speech or there's this like sort of monologue in the, in the beginning and the woman is recounting this like horrifying and sexy experience that she had and it's like straight out of story of the eye it's like has to do with you know eggs and strange other things um there's uh, some listeners and watchers right now who are, are screaming at their phones or their computer because uh, a few times previously, a secret society has come up. And so <laughs> some people being like, get to the secret society, get to the secret society. Uh, <laughs> Emily, what, what was Asafel? What was the secret society that he that he helped form? Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, Asafel. So um, Headless, you know, literally tr meaning meaning sort of a headlessness. Um, I guess people might be familiar with the emblem, which is the Andre Masson uh, drawing of the headless person with the um, the kind of holding a skull in in one hand and like a knife, and there's it's very interesting. Um, but it was, I guess, we could say a sort of attempt to. Um, re I think they called it a religion of madness and like a reinsertion of the sacred into what they saw as like a increasingly profane utilitarian society where violence was only being used for these like horrible, um, horrible ends as opposed to like ecstatic whatever. So they're, they're, I think they're most famous for, and I guess I should say, I think it only lasted maybe like a few years, three, three or four years. Um, Walter Benjamin, I think, attended some of the um, sessions, if I'm not mistaken, uh, as well as some other people. Uh, but they sort of meditated, they read texts, they talked about Nietzsche, they had like a journal that they put out. Um, their goal, their sort of, in their mind, I guess, what would be the supreme, sacred, whatever sacrifice would be a human sacrifice. Um, and the story is that they had many people who volunteered, but no one who uh, volunteered to be the sort of sacrifice, but no one who wanted to do the sacrifice thing. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, that's like the tale that gets told. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it was, it's sort of this idea of something being closed off from the rest of the world um, in an attempt to make it sacred, but at the same time, kind of open to contagion. I think a big, a big sort of impetus for starting Asafal in the College of Sociology was 
um, Bataille had been like involved in other journals and like left wing revolutionary stuff. And he felt like it, no matter what, it always became like a kind of power about power struggle or something to do with power. So he wanted to kind of cut the head off a, a thing and make it um, aggressively religious and attempt to find some, something that was based on freedom instead of power. And so I think a big part of Asifal and the College of Sociology was about um, sort of the first issue anyway was about Nietzsche and kind of saving him or trying to, um, you know, saving him from fascist appropriations. But I think one thing that's really interesting about Bataille is that he's, and Benjamin Noyes talks about this in his book on him, but he's a sort of thinker of contagion and and um, he doesn't want to sort of mm -hmm. radical breaks or cuts. So he didn't. He also didn't want Nietzsche to be appropriated by the left either. It's like this idea of keeping something or someone as free as possible, which is impossible <laughs> because we're always like appropriating things. But it's this interesting movement between like how do we not appropriate something, but also not like reject it, um, and also not fully assimilate it. If, if that, if you see what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. I was gonna say, I think that we were touching on about Bataille's critique of utility is really important. I feel like, the, I mean, we already kind of touched on that in like base matter and things, but this like the critique of, I think in an inner, in inner experience, the critique of project of, you know, subsume, like when Bataille talks about sovereignty, it meaning like so, someone basically being free of subsuming oneself to some kind of end goal or like, something that's that's a utility beyond you know just a, your just your existence so i wanted to say that there's a really great quote and i think it might be useful to talk most of viewers who are maybe are more likely than normal people to be part of some form of secret society is that bataille one of my favorite writings about bataille or by bataille is in the college of sociology um, when he spoke about secret societies um, which he said is the quote when when i spoke of totality i was seeking to designate a reality existing for itself a reality in which the pure and simple pursuit of existence, the pure and simple will to be, is what matters regardless of any particular goal. This existential character belongs, strictly speaking, to the secret society. So him talking about like an existential secret society versus like a political society, that the political society has some goal or utility and the existential society, you know, exists for the sake of existence itself and that's it, um, which, which the rest of the kind of the bourgeois world thinks is absurd. So think that that's kind of, I mean, I don't know, a lot of secret societies I know of don't necessarily function that way and definitely have some sort of goal or something, but you know, that was Bataille's idea of what the secret society was for, so. Yeah, no, I'm really glad you unpacked that, uh, but both uh, uh, to come back to utility, right? Because, you, you know, I, I think it's really the dominant philosophy, the dominant organizing principle of, of right now and has been for a long time. So I, I think that's why Bataille is so powerful and needed for the modern world. And of course, the secret societies, like as you said, Nick, uh, uh, everybody that I know who's involved with secret societies won't shut the hell up about how they're involved with secret societies. <laughs> I shouldn't say everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, many people. Um, but the uh, the sacrifice story, I wanted your opinion on that, Nick, because it, it sounds like the kind of story that a secret si society would like make up, um, <laughs> both, both for sort of like clout and for mystery, but also for, for fun. Um, but I have also heard that that story uh, explained as um, that they, they foresaw the, the invasion of, of France by the Nazis and they wanted to steal themselves to possibly fight back, to commit acts that they did not have the courage to do and they were going to do a human sacrifice to, to make themselves uh, able to do that. Uh, and I think that's a, uh, a very interesting version of, of the story. Uh, and also to, to clarify, when we talk about transgression, I, I think a lot of people nowadays often think of the, the right wing when it comes to transgression. Uh, like uh, uh, "Kill All Normies" by by Angela Nagel is, is a great is a great work on that. Uh, but but Bataille, he, he hated anti semites and fascists. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, yeah. oh, good. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, I think that one of the things with Bataille, I mean, some of the critiques on the left, I mean, are you know part of an overall anti Nietzschean, you know, that that kind of thread on the left. And I think some of the things that I've seen have been you know, Bataille saw what he was opposing as this kind of bourgeois utilitarianism, but then I think that 
some of their interpretations, and I think Benjamin Noyes has, has some critiques of him this way when he talks about Bataille in his book on accelerationism, that, you know, Bataille, sometimes his interest in, like, the Dionysian frenzy is sort of close to this, like, Wolf of Wall Street sort of thing. <laughs> like, and I think that that can sometimes be the critique that maybe what Bataille was into is actually more of this, like, deterritorializing, de you know, accelerating capitalism and, and not... And, and that Bataille thought he was critiquing capitalism, but actually, like, he, in some ways, is, is kind of interested in, in, in some of the ways we now talk more about capitalism maybe than they did at the time. So I think that that's, that's one of the critiques. I don't really agree with that, but I think, like, yeah, this kind of overall, like, anti-Nietzscheanism is, is, you know, has a relationship to critiques of Bataille on the left. I mean, and, and also this idea, and I mean, it is true, I think, that him kind of putting the as existential secret society or, like, sovereignty as not being subsumed to some project, I mean, that does kind of mess up a lot of, like, sort of the more kind of Marxist-Leninist sort of projects. Like, I don't think Bataille, like, there's this totalizing character in some of that that I think Bataille doesn't work well with and kind of continues to, like, stick in the craw. So I don't I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I've heard that critique, too, this idea of, like, Bataille as hyper-capitalist or something, but I think it's, I think it is a mis. I mean, in my, because because his he his sort of like version of expenditure or whatever it can't by definition it can't be like mass produced or mm -hmm. and, it, and so it's definitely opposed. I think but is very opposed to at least like whatever version of capitalism this is, um, which I think is why he's interesting right now. Um, but also, I think there is something kind of like quote unquote dangerous about him, like because. I think he can't, he, like Nietzsche, maybe he is a thinker who can be appropriated by like many different kinds of thought. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm curious what you said, Jonathan, about like transgression being associated with the right wing now. Like, do you mean, I'm, can you say more about that? Yeah, well, I guess perhaps, you know, that's, I think sort of within the, uh, especially in the 60s, you have people who at least call themselves progressives, left wingers, uh, um, uh, who sort of claim transgression, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, kind of uh, starting, you know, in the in the 2010s and uh, pushed into uh, a whole new level uh, with Trumpism, you have people who are who are on the right, who are trying to uh, freak out the normies, who are trying to uh, uh, use transgression to uh, break down what they see as the, the liberal order, right? Because uh, they view themselves as completely under the yoke of, of liberalism. Uh, and uh, liberal institutions, liberal modes of being, liberal thought. So, you know, I guess I shouldn't say, that, you know, if you grab someone off the street, uh, and of course there's still lots of uh, people who call themselves progressive and left-wing who uh, uh, engage in transgression, and there's lots of sort of mainstream ideas on the left that, that are viewed as, or can be viewed as transgressive, right? That, uh, that would completely reorganize society. Uh, you know, defund the police, right, would be a, in many ways a huge transgression not even that long ago. Uh, so I shouldn't say uh, mostly associ associated with the right, but but I think in some way they are or have been the the loudest voices, the ones that have been getting the most attention, and the ones in some ways who have been deliberately using transgression. Mm -hmm. um, though we still, I, I think it's still the often associated uh, with the left, right? You know, because of because of the hippies, because of free love, because of you know some of the movements uh, on the cultural left that that I mentioned. Yeah. yeah. I think it is a reaction back against some of it, like, you know, I think some people on the left in reacting to kind of what Jonathan just described is, are kind of like, um, so what we were saying about to transgress, you kind of have to keep the, the taboo in place in some way. I've, I've seen critiques of Bataille saying, you know, this isn't going to create an entirely new world world order. And so like, that's a project, you know, <laughs> like you have to pursue that as kind of the thing that Bataille critiques of like, this it has political ends that you know it's it, it's the ends of its existence of, of this kind of organization of, of like that kind of leftism is to produce this other society um which which is living for an end other than existence itself which i think is part like so i do think there's and you know i say this a little bit because i've been part of a, a bunch of like i spent years part of kind of marxist leninist organizing and have critiques that bataille has been really kind of therapeutic to read so i do think there's an element of bataille that doesn't quite fit into either like i don't think he's you know hyper capitalist i think he does have a critique of capitalism and maybe a critique of these kind of more authoritarian leftist projects too 
and maybe that's part of the issue. <laughs> it doesn't really fit properly in either of those things. I think that's totally, I, I totally agree with that. And I think this is why, I, I think him and Simone Bay are similar in this in this way. They both sort of have what we would, con what people would maybe consider now to be like, quote unquote, conservative and progressive views or or whatever, I don't know. Like there's just many shades in there, you know? And I think, I think that's actually really interesting. It, it brings up this question of like, what does it even mean to transgress now? Like it, are like, you know, this idea of like edgelordism or the, I, yeah. I just don't, I don't even know if that's transgression, you know, it's like, it's like very, um, I'm not sure. And I think there, for all of his like um, calls to transgression and his sort of being a philosopher of excrement and whatever, I do think there's something in him that um, calls for something like nuance or like really, really close readings, especially when we're talking about like the like I don't know people and texts and there's like this ethics in there where it's like a, a, that I think he shares in this weird way with Simone Bay even though she didn't like him um, where it's like a person is not what they seem you know a text is not what it what it seems so this idea of like constantly rereading each other and the other and and ideas and like what what so it almost calls into question like what is even the left and right wing or what what does it even mean to choose a is side. It yeah, it also seems like there's like an earnestness in Bataille where he's like very serious in a way that like isn't very edgelordy because a lot of the, I mean, mm -hmm. my impression of that is very, it's a very ironic. So it's transgression, but you don't really believe the things that you're transgressing are sacred. And so like, it's, it's already, you know, but Bataille, I mean, he seemed part of it, the ferociously religious thing is that he seems to like believe so strongly in it <laughs> that, that transgressing it like breaks him in some way. Otherwise, it's not really a limit experience. It's kind of a joke, I think. Maybe that's the difference between like a meme, like an edgelord meme and Bataille. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to get into wrap up territory, but uh, is, is there anything that, that either of you, you know, really wanted to get across about Bataille, something that you wanted to unpack, something that you feel is important for, for people to know? Uh, Emily, do you have anything? Oh, um, uh, I mean, I just think he, I just, I don't know. I mean, I think, for, I guess it's sort of maybe, um, what I was just saying, which is like this idea of locating like residues of the sacred in this like weird, I don't know, very utilitarian, um, society we live in. And I think that that there is like some kind of um, even though he's so wild and bonkers and like, I love him for that. There is also this other thing of like this, you know, I think he's like really inciting his readers to like reconsider form and matter in these very like complicated ways. So he almost like for me, he, there's, a, there's a sense in which when I read Bataille, it's like, learning to read in this way it, it, he almost like teaches you how to read in this other way because you're not really sure what it is that you're looking at <laughs> uh which maybe has to do with base matter you know it's like that moment of like what the fuck am i looking at um so yeah i don't know that's my that's my answer for the moment yeah uh nick yeah i mean i think it's kind of following on everything we've been saying I guess especially for the occult community, which I guess I sort of represent a little bit, is that, you know, it's, I think that Bataille has really important advice about like utility, about, um, you know, about about critiquing a, like kind of a preordained project, that kind of goal. Um, I think, you know, there's like a purity in his kind of spirituality that, you know, even though he think he, even though he's an atheist, to me, he's like very deeply religious and, and mystical in a way. Like, I mean, maybe that's because I'm that kind of atheist or something, but but it sort of fits like he an encounter with reality that's direct in that way um, without all of these levels, like like Emily was saying about mediation. And I think in the occult community or spiritual communities that, you know, are interested in like Aleister Crowley and, you know, Gnosticism and all this stuff, there, there can end up being a lot of levels of mediation and, and steps between you and an encounter with reality. But I think Bataille kind of is this reminder of, you know, actually uh, kind of, you know, inner experience is this direct experience <laughs> that um, is, is like really important and pure. So I think that that's what I get out of Bataille spiritually. That's really important. It kind of cuts through a lot of, kind of like in a Zen-like way, it kind of cuts through a lot of this other stuff. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, I hope that people can get that from him. Yeah. 
Well, I, I guess it's time for, for plugs. And I know now, you know, everybody is, is listening and being like, man, I, I wish I could know more about Bataille. In fact, I wish I could uh, take a course about him. Uh, Emily, what are, what are your plugs? Um, I am teaching a class on Bataille at GCAS online um, in September. And you can sign up uh, if you want. <laughs> We uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk specifically about his uh, religious writings uh, and and his mystical trilogy too. Excellent, excellent. By the way, I, I didn't explain what GCAS is at the beginning. So that's the, uh, the Global Center for Advanced Study. It's a debt-free university. Uh, it's really cool. It's where I go. It's where Emily, uh, one of the places that she teaches as well as running her own courses. Uh, Emily, I'm also going to put your, your other plugs uh, down into, uh, yeah, sorry, where, where else? Uh, other places where people can find you online, but you have you have your homepage, right? Is it just, is it emilyrusso.com? Yes, just my first and last name dot com. Yeah, so people go go check the show notes and uh, check that out. Uh, Nick plugs. Um, yeah, I guess that essay I, we we talked about that I wrote a while back is and other stuff is on my blog. So that's the lightinvisible dot org. Um, so you know, if you want to read that essay and other weird stuff about people like Crowley and Kenneth Grant and stuff, <laughs> it's on. It's over there. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, well, uh, uh, thanks so much to you two and uh, everybody listening. Uh, check out those awesome links and uh, thanks again. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh, oh.